good morning good afternoon good evening depending on wherever in the world you are on behalf of the department of law north south university it is my utmost pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this talk by professor gary simpson uh, as the title of the talk is the sentimental life of international law revisited slightly different from to this uh, talk's title uh, there is a title by Professor uh, Gary Simpson, a recent book written by him, published by Oxford University Press, which I had the pleasure of reading. Uh, in his book, I would say Professor Simpson takes a very interesting look at the way we academics and the other actors uh, look at international law in a very refreshing way, I would say. And as I understand it, he stake on reading international law is fundamentally different from many others in our discipline. He refers to literary works. He alludes to many different kinds of literary works. And he looks at several questions, issues in fundamentally refreshing way. And it's not just about international law. It's also about international law academics. For example, he writes that in traditional law review articles, we would often write that all errors are that of the author. In a way, maybe implying that is not really only that of the author. Otherwise, why would we say so? Uh, he, in my understanding, the refreshing look that he has taken on international law, at least it has encouraged some sort of source searching in my approach to international law in my reading of international law, and maybe the next law review article that I would write, maybe in many cases, I'll have to think a little differently. He has encouraged us, as I understand it, to write about sentimental international law. Maybe I would think about writing on international law in a different way, in a more refreshing way. And Professor Simpson, briefly alludes to a talk that he has once given in Geneva on humor and international law. And in a rather, uh, I would say, candid way, he says that after the talk, one of the students approached him or asked him a question or a comment that I thought it would be funnier. And he sympathizes uh, with that student. I can assure you, Although the talk is on sentimental life of international law, the talk would not in any way be sentimental. It would be a very interesting talk, I'm sure. I look forward to what Professor Simpson says and also to your comments. Over to you, Professor Simpson. Great, well, thank you very much, Rizwan, uh, for that introduction. Um, I think you've really understood something about the book um, there and why why I wrote it and, and what it contains. I mean, I'll obviously try to elaborate, but uh, yeah, great introduction. And it's, it's, it's very, very good to be here today. I was actually supposed to be in Dhaka in January uh, for a writer's festival, um, but that um, is not going to happen now. Uh, one day I hope to, 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 to come to Bangladesh um, and come to the university there and, um, possibly speak at, uh, speak at the annual Writers' Festival. I know they have in Dhaka, which is um, quite prominent on the literary calendar. Um, so I'm gonna speak for a little while about the book um, and then open it up for the sorts of questions that you might want to ask me because your interests in the book may be different from mine. I mean, one thing I should say is that I've been speaking about the book for quite a while now at different um, venues and it, it, it sort of comes out differently each time. So, you know, one writes a book and it never feels like the same book in each talk. Something is emphasized, something changes. I really feel like rewriting the book uh, in light of not just of these experiences, but also of the various reviews that have come in over the last few months in Opinio Juris, there's, uh, there's one about to be published in the magazine Humanity um, as well. And um, each of the reviewers has really captured something um, very generously in most cases about the, about the book that's made me want to uh, 
not just rewrite it, but retitle it. You know, I've, I've, I've thought of the, the, the wistful life of international law, uh, the rebellious life of international law. But anyway, I've settled on the sentimental life of international law. So let me just say something about why, you know, how I came to write the book. Um, so, I mean, writing, writing books is a bit of a mysterious process, but I knew that I wanted to write what you might call an essayistic book. Um, a book that sort of spoke to disciplines and people and audiences um, outside the field of international law and spoke to people inside international law differently. So I knew I wanted to write a book that was only barely recognizable as a book about international law and a book that might also, as well as um, illuminate and educate, uh, would also sort of entertain people, would be itself a kind of literary product. So I mean, it's up to readers to decide whether that's been successful, but that's what I sort of decided to do, if decided isn't putting things too strongly. Um, so I approached the field quite differently. And I think Rizwan just pointed something rather important out already, which is that I wanted to describe not so much international law, as a field of, of, of rules or norms, but rather the experience of being um, an international lawyer. So that was the idea. It was about, I mean, you could say it was a kind of ethnography of international law. What does it feel like to be um, a person um, who practices or teaches or writes in international law? What are the sorts of experiences we have as international lawyers, it was a very, very important aspect of the book. So it has a, it has a sort of autobiographical, um, it has an autobiographical approach that's obvious, but I didn't want it to be, you know, entirely solipsistic. I wanted it to speak to the sorts of um, experiences I think lots of people have as soon as they begin doing international law. I mean, one sort of classic experience we have is bouncing back and forth between a kind of idealistic um, fiction about the system of, of law and its utopian possibilities, and then um, becoming somewhat sort of disillusioned and cynical before reaching some kind of balance. And I wanted to describe how that happened to me and sort of give some, give some detail about that. So that was one aspect of it. And a second thing that happened was that I, I, I read um, Justice uh, Judge Rosalind Higgins famous book, Problems and Processes of International Law, many years ago. And she says in the first sentence, you know, international law is more than rules. You know, international law is more than rules. And um, I mean, we, both, we all sort of accept that point now, I think. Um, most of us have some sort of idea that international law is a system of thought, as a legal order, um, even if one simply restricts oneself to thinking about you know, soft law, for example. We know that something's going on in international law that is more than rules. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Professor Higgins, my predecessor here at the LSE, in fact, um, or a predecessor here, meant that international law was also kind of norms or epistemic communities in a kind of New Haven, McDougal Laswell way. But I wanted to ask in this book, you know, how much more than rules is it? Um, what are the limits of international law? What counts as international law? What doesn't count as international law? And in particular, um, I wanted to suggest that international law's power, and I, I do think it's very, very important to understand it, the international legal order as an extremely powerful legal order. I mean, I, I think we, we, we often make the mistake of assuming that it's somehow weak by focusing on the enforcement problem. We sort of look at the world, notice that Russia has invaded Ukraine and conclude that international law must be somehow marginal or weak. And I, I just think that's simply the wrong way of, of thinking about it. I think it's an extremely powerful way of speaking about the world. And I wanted to think about its power and its power for me um, lies not in its rules, not in its institutions, not in any enforceability it might have, but in its ability to constitute the sort of language we speak when we speak about international politics. And what we speak defines what we do. I mean, as I always say, um, tanks don't move on their own. 
They move by the power of ideas. The world, of course, is material, but nevertheless, um, we, at our peril, underestimate the ideational factors that go into constructing the world of international politics. So I wanted to take this idea seriously. I wasn't by any means the first person that I had. Of course, we've had studies of the structure of international legal argument, but I wanted to approach them not so much from a conceptual or theoretical perspective, but from a literary perspective. I wanted to ask, you know, what does this language do in the world? Um, how does it work? And would some ideas of, of literary, literary theory, um, some concepts of literary theory help us understand international law? So that was the idea. And before I say something about how I pursued that idea through the book, I just want to go back to my point about language. What I've noticed in the last eight or nine months in relation to the war in Ukraine um, is just how powerfully constitutive international law is. Uh, we have had quite a large number of prime ministers in Britain over the last few weeks. It's hard to keep track, but certainly Boris Johnson and in particular um, the short-lived Liz Truss, both approached the Ukraine war from what I took to be a highly legalistic um, perspective. I mean, they spoke about, about the Ukraine war through the language and prism of international law. And I think that language to a certain extent defined what they were willing to contemplate in relation to the war. So if you listen to um, former Prime Minister Truss speaking about uh, Ukraine, she, she immediately and, and, and regularly consistently invoked international legal ideas and norms and practices. So when she spoke about, inter about Ukraine, she spoke about war crimes trials, about political sovereignty, about territorial integrity, about sanctions, about punishments, about the UN Charter, about Article 2.4. In fact, most of what she said about Ukraine was a form of international legalese. And the same, same goes for Boris Johnson. Um, and the same will probably go to the extent that he's as interested in international relations as they are for, for someone like Rishi Sunak. And I think this could be, uh, this, th this was the case across the board amongst Western politicians with the sort of partial exceptions, say, of President Macron. But the dominant language has, I think, been an international legal language, and the dominant approach has been through ideas of international law. Now, I mean, there's a lot that could be said about this, and I have said a lot over the last few months, and I can say more in the question and answer session, but I just want to um, leave this section of the talk by saying that that could be a good or a bad thing. It could be a very positive thing for international law that everyone's talking in the language of international law, or it could be a bad thing because this is not the right language to speak about Ukraine, um, or because this language is closing off various other options, or because the, the way in which politicians or the political class have spoken about international law is a sort of unsophisticated, um, overdetermined um, positivism or legalism, if you like, um, that doesn't really that doesn't really reflect the sophistication of the linguistic order that international law is. So I think that was an important part of the book. Um, I had sort of three, I have three ideas floating around in the subtitle of the book. So as Rizwan said, it's called The Sentimental Life of International Law um, because I wanted to emphasize the lived qualities of international legal experience and the sorts of sentiments that, that produce international legal practice or, or are an aspect of international legal practice. But the subtitle is um, Literature, um, uh, Language and Longing in Global Politics. And I'll just say something about each of those. So on one hand, it's a fairly straightforward um, law and literature approach to international law. So you know, it uses literary texts, for example, as a way of not just illustrating its main points, but of telling something really, really important about international law, either because international law or international legal speak has been portrayed in pieces of, of literature or that pieces of literature actually are 
the forms of international law, they're forms of persuasion, they're forms of language, they sort of constitute the world, they're world making um, moments or gestures, just as international law itself is. So I, you know, use um, literary works, you know, it's studded with various um, poets and novelists who I happen to have read, I haven't read any more than anyone else. Some people seem to seem to think I have, but in fact, all I've done is use it more than most other people do. I mean, I, there are a huge number of very well-read people in the international legal field, um, but they haven't sort of self-consciously or perhaps even pretentiously used these texts in their in their books. So that was one idea I had um, of thinking about literature through, I don't know, through Yeats, through Shirley Hazard, through you know Muriel Spark, um, through you know Shakespeare, even whatever. And then the second aspect of the subtitle was language. You know, I wanted to take the language of international law um, seriously. You know, how does it work? If international law is a success, it's not because it has an army or a police force. There is, there has been a dream throughout the history of at least modern international law of a UN army or, 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 or some sort of international police force. But that dream has never been realized. And for some people, it feels like a nightmare anyway, but the dream has never been realized. And so in the absence of police, in the absence of a legislature, in the absence of a parliament, in the absence of a sort of sovereign, the king in parliament in, in British terms, um, it operates as a sort of language of persuasion. And I wanted to ask, you know, how does it persuade? What are its rhetorical qualities and moves? How does it work? Um, and in one chapter, for example, I look at the way it has an often bathetic, it makes a number of bathetic moves, you know, it uses bathos, or bathos is a sort of regular tonal accompaniment to international legal practice. So, um, so taking language um, seriously, or taking it seriously in a different way from the way other people have taken it seriously, was an important aspect of what it meant for me to do international law. And then thirdly, I wanted to write a hopeful book. It was hard to be hopeful at times when one looks out into the world. Um, one sees you know, the vast accumulations of wealth on one hand, um, terrible and violent immiseration and poverty on the other, an increasing gap indeed between the wealthy and, and poor, uh, a kind of apathy, um, institutional apathy, corporate apathy to the problem of global warming, um, humanitarian disaster, and so on and so forth. And I wanted to think about this, obviously, seriously, like most international lawyers, and I wanted to critique the practices of global politics that produce these outcomes. But I also wanted to offer what I took to be a kind of hopefulness in each of the, or in many of the chapters of the book. And these ideas of hopefulness were sometimes gestures towards sort of breaking the language and remaking it to reflect the current um, disorders and promise of the um, contemporary scene. At other times, it was a more sort of minor utopian idea. Uh, sometimes it was more sort of flatly idealistic. Here's how we could do things better as international lawyers. Here are the sorts of ideas or here is the sort of tone in which we could speak that might somehow speak more powerfully to our various audiences. So this idea of hope uh, was important because it's hard to speak hopefully. It's not just hard to speak hopefully because of the current situation, but it's also hard because um, utopian ideas were you know, partially discredited through the 20th century. People have made a sort of link between utopia and, I don't know, communism or fascism, and between communism and fascism and Stalin and Mussolini. Um, and in a way, I wanted to break each of, these, each of these links or each of these connections. I didn't speak explicitly about communism, but um, I thought it would be worthwhile retrieving the hopefulness in certain um, concepts of world order, uh, whether that be, whether those be liberal, socialist, communist, whatever. Um, so that was, that was also a big, big part of it. Um, 
And I felt that was important too, because international law has both a utopian and an anti-utopian aspect. On one hand, it, people who go into international law are tend to be utopians. We've all we all started off at secondary school saying we wanted to change the world. Otherwise, it's hardly worth going into international law, I would have thought. Um, but on the other hand, we find ourselves in a discipline which has an explicitly anti-utopian um, bent. In other words, it's a response, in a way, international law is a response to the excesses of utopian programs. International law says, forget about one world utopianism. This is a system based on sovereignty. It's a sort of system of limited, uh, limited community and, and unlimited pluralism. It's a system that begins in Europe, at least, in the 16. Um, 40s, as they say, it's, it's founding myth is a Westphalian myth of sovereign autonomy, not utopian speculation. It's a it's a founding myth of pluralism, not religion. Um, it's a founding myth of decentralized control, not centralized government, spiritual or temporal or material. So it has this powerful anti-utopian idea. It's, it's, it's in a way it's saying there are a number of different ways to organize oneself in the earth. We must allow these various ways to flourish. That was the, if you like, the original idea of international law. It's there in, in, in the UN Charter and the sovereign equality provisions, for example, and the commitment to something like domestic jurisdiction or internal affairs. So International law has this sort of utopian, anti-utopian dimension. And my book does too. I mean, all books about international law in a way are, are, like, are like that. So that was a sort of very important aspect of the book too. And I, I wanted to, to also try to write at the limit. I, I've spoken about the limits of international law. So one of the, one of the ideas is to explore the limit. You know, at what point, would you write a book that ceased to be international altogether? But I also wanted to show or explore the limits of international legalism. I mean, are there ideas, areas of, of, of political discourse that simply are simply inhospitable to international legal language? In other words, does international law have its limit? And I was inspired partly in this by going to see a uh, a play called Consent at the National Theatre in, in London, in which um, a group of lawyers were couples, married couples, were sort of getting divorced and, 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 and having arguments and so on and so forth. And many of them were trying to speak the language of law to their, to their various problems. And this language came across in the play deliberately, no doubt, as um, rather sort of wooden and strangulated, as if the playwright was saying, you know, law is extraordinarily important um, for resolving disputes and organizing the world, but there are places in which it seems somehow um, incongruous or inappropriate or perverse. And I wanted to think about when international law reached its limits, uh, whether there were areas of global politics that just weren't suited to international legal ideas or whether the international legal ideas we had were too ancient, were too venerable, were too inelastic, were too conservative to respond to the current, to the current disorders, whether we had to shake up the languages of international law by speaking international law differently or by speaking a different international law if there's any difference between those two formulations. So that was also an important aspect uh, of the book. And I also, I suppose, wanted to um, just simply re-describe some historical moments in international law through a slightly different lens. I have always asked in my work, I think, what would it be like to think about this subject through this particular approach rather than through this orthodox approach or what would it be like to think of i mean and there's a chapter on on this um uh, uh, on the law of war crimes um called unprecedented um in international criminal law uh and in that chapter i sort of think about how we might approach international criminal law through a kind of alternative history one that maybe begins at the Moscow show trials in 1936 and 37 rather than Nuremberg or even in in, in Tokyo rather than 
rather than Nuremberg. So it's just us starting in a different place somehow seemed like an important way to approach international law. Or what if we approached international um, criminal law through the monuments that seek to memorialize certain moments in history that are also international criminal law moments? Or what sort of memorialization is international criminal law involved in? And what is that what, what is the relationship of that memorialization to the memorialization one sees in public monuments around, around the world? So I wanted to retrieve um, a certain sort of counter history of international criminal law. And I also wanted to ask in that chapter, why is it that international criminal law disappoints us so much? Why is it, as I once said, a law of disappointment? And I, I considered how literary theorists approach the problem of disappointment, and they at least sometimes approach it through the technique of bathos. Bathos existing in the relationship between sort of sublime, what we would call the universal aspiration to justice, and the everyday or mundane, the sort of grubby reality of international politics, or indeed um, legal practice. And I think I thought perhaps bathos was a useful tool for trying to reinterpret or reread that sense of disappointment we all have in the relations between universal claims to justice on one hand and the everyday materiality or practice of international law um, of international law on the other hand. But there are other things I do that are you know, a bit more, I mean, this all sounds very serious, that, that were a bit more playful than that. So, I have a chapter called The Sentimental Lives of International Lawyers, in which I just talk about the sorts of um, the sorts of ideas or the ways in which international lawyers live their lives in a sort of semi-public way. So I sort of have a little section that's shorter than I would have liked it on the use of acknowledgments in international legal texts as a way of situating the international lawyer as a particular person at a particular time. So it's a sort of advertisement for oneself to use Norman Mailer's language. The acknowledgements in my view do a great deal of work, but the sort of personal aspect of the acknowledgement almost always just drops out of sight immediately when the book is under construction. So there's no sense in which the person's place or positionality so strongly asserted in the acknowledgements of the book continues into the book itself. And yet, you know, people who read international legal texts as academics often go to the acknowledgements first. If you go to a book, uh, if you go to a book launch, the first thing everything's, everyone's reading is the acknowledgements, not, not just to find out whether they're in them, but to find out what this person is like somehow, what sort of person, and, and, and therefore what sort of international lawyer is this person. So, there's a chapter on, on not just on the acknowledgements, but the sorts of lives we lead. You know, why, why a certain glamour attends the idea of being an international lawyer rather than simply a lawyer? Why it seems somehow uh, more desirable to be, say, an international human rights lawyer than a trade union lawyer or an employment lawyer doing the, the, the sort of tough stuff at the national level. So there's a chapter, you know, there's a chapter on that. And um, there are chapters that try and intervene in the recent history wars in international law. There's a chapter, as Rizwan said, uh, on comedy in international law. I suppose that chapter is really an attempt to find the limits of international law. I mean, can there be such a thing as a, a comedy uh, of international law, international law's comic disposition, I call it. Is it ever funny? Is it ever appropriate to be funny? What would it mean to be funny? What function does or what functions do jokes play um, or have in international legal life and scholarship? Um, Freud told us that jokes like dreams reveal something about our inner life, our repressed subconscious. What would be the repressed subconscious of international law? What is the what can it not say, and what might it? What, what what might we find out that it ought to, or or should, or could say, through the language of of comedy? So I approach international law through through you know irony and um, what I call sort of blasphemous laughter via um, Diogenes, the uh, Greek philosopher, and then I have a final couple of chapters which are more frankly 
utopian, one on friendliness and the other on gardening. And in both these cases, I'm trying to engineer or reconstruct a more upbeat, more hopeful international law. In the first place, I ask you, know, what would it like? What would it be like for states to actually have friendly relations with each other? What would it mean to approach one's um, contemporaries, one's analogs, other states, other sovereigns as friends? And what would it, what would it mean to declare to one's enemies, um, either someday I will be your friend, or as I have Zarathustra. Um, Nietzsche's characters say in the in the book, uh, 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 at least be my enemy. I, I imagine, in fact, Russia saying to the West now, at least be my enemy. Let's approach each other as enemies with differing interests, um, rather than approaching Russia as a world historical enemy of mankind, which strikes me as very, very unuseful. So that's, that's one chapter on friendly relations. And then there's another chapter, which has been a bit contentious on gardening. Uh, what might it mean to approach international law through a sort of through pastoralism in a kind of metaphorical sense, and then also using various examples of actual, you know, concrete, if that's not a perverse way of putting it, gardening, um, to generate ideas about international law. So in one case, I talk about Rebecca West's cyclamens, that the cyc the cyclamen or cyclamen, as, as we say in some places. The cyclamen growing girl outside the Nuremberg war crimes trials in her greenhouse trying to grow flowers um, while the reconstruction of Germany and Nuremberg war crimes trials are taking place inside the courtroom. I try and ask what would it mean to sort of decenter the trial, to focus on horticulture rather than legalized, legalized punishment. So that's the general idea, uh, or rather, those are a whole bunch of utterly scattered gun ideas. But that might give you a sort of sense of what's at play in the in the book. But I'm really much more interested in hearing from from you lot than I am from hearing more about from myself about myself in relation to this book. So thank you for listening, and I, I look forward to at least attempting an answer to your questions. I mean, there is a passage in the book, which is well worth reading if you go on to become academics, about how not to answer questions and how not to get stuck in the wrong sort of question, um, how to reject a question politely, of course, but, um, but um, we may see this in some sort of practice in the next 25 minutes. Thank you, Professor Simpson, for your excellent talk, and I would say rather unusual but thought-provoking talk. Now, the first question that I would like to put to you is on sentimentality. So mm. how could international law be sentimental and avoid sentimentality? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and you would think somebody who'd written a book called The Sentimental Life of International Law would know the answer to it. Um, I guess the best way to describe this is through uh, maybe in two or three ways. One would be to to say something about my experiences of teaching and practicing international law, which seemed to me to veer back and forth between a kind of unsentimental, what we take to be an unsentimental, dry, technocratic, you know, slightly sort of Protestant, uh, tearless approach to human suffering and human violence. So it seems to me that law, to a certain extent, international law, human rights law, spends a fair bit of its time trying to take lived the lived experience of pain in the world and translate that pain into a sort of fungible legal language. And I wondered, though that's a very noble, heroic project in some ways, I wondered if there would be, if there were losses incurred in that move from, um, from pain to technocracy, if you like. So that was one, that's one aspect of the, one aspect of, of sentimentality. But then it struck me that international law had also taken its own sentimental turn towards sort of tearfulness. Um, so that, for example, the move to, to set, setting victims right at the heart 
of the field seem to me to be a, a move to sentimentality. We have to do something about the victim's tears in international law. We can't just have a trial. We can't just set up a dispute resolution mechanism. We can't just adjust the terms of trade. We have to respond directly to felt experience. And sometimes that resulted in what some people have taken to be a sort of over-sentimental approach to international law, something that's, that's too tearful. And I've actually also, of course, seen, seen on occasions people become a little bit too close to the material of war crimes violations or human rights violations, which made me uncomfortable, a kind of moral voyeurism, if you like. So I felt that we were sort of careening back and forth between these two modes. And one was, one was dry and technocratic, the other was sort of over sentimental. And what I describe as the sentimental life of international law is something between those two, trying to find something that sort of exists between those two poles. Uh, if you like, um, a positive sentimentality, or what I call near, near tearfulness. And I suppose I, you know, I drew some of this from the um, Enlightenment scholars of the uh, Scottish late 18th century, the Scottish Enlightenment, and their concerns with ideas of sentiment, um, David Hume, or 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 sympathy, um, Adam Smith, and the idea that these. These, what we might call in modern speak, emotional categories were somehow relevant to our approach to capitalism, indeed to the workings of capitalism for Adam Smith, and might also be relevant to the workings of international law. So it's got both a historical, philosophical, Scottish common sense basis, but also a kind of anthropological, bi autobiographical basis in just my observations of what was going on when people try to practice this impossible discipline. And you know, as you know, if you've read it, um, one, of the, one of the quotes I use is Janet Malcolm's um, description of psychoanalysis as, the, um, as being both impossible and difficult. You know, impossible and difficult. So and the idea of something that's impossible and difficult is of course very witty, but it precisely states the stakes and terms of psychoanalysis. And I think that might be true also of of international law. And it's right in that sweet spot that I tried to find or tried to explore. It's in that sweet spot that I tried to explore, um, that, that I used the book to explore. So that's, that's, the, uh, that, that's the idea. That's at least one or two answers to the question. Thank you so much. Uh, next question, I would like to uh, mars two questions actually, one from one of our teaching assistants, Mashu Jawad. He asked, if literary language can be misused to put a favorable interpretation of international law. And I would like to add one more question to that, that the managerial and a contextual international law, could it be sometimes a mere device of evasion? Thank you. What was that last word? Revision, did you say? Evasion. Evasion, evasion, yeah. Look. I mean, my position is that um, all of this, in other words, these different approaches or theories, you know, however you want to describe them to international law, um, are sort of capable of being, as you put it, sort of misused or used in different ways. So I'm not suggesting necessarily or am I? Let's let's think about that. I don't think I'm suggesting that this sort of literary life approach, this sentimental life approach, doesn't come full of possible pitfalls and pratfalls. I mean, it, there are clearly mistakes one can make. There are excesses one can fall into. There are errors one can make um in approaching international law like this and of course one could adopt a, a kind of sentimental approach to certain subjects that are actually set back the cause of progressive politics i mean you might say for example that different forms of populism are precisely sentimental responses to the socio-economic conditions we find ourselves in and those sentimental approaches are extremely dangerous that the, the, the populism is based on i mean i read i read the other day 
uh, an essay um, by someone who said that, I think it might maybe even been in The Guardian, that said that politics really wasn't about ideas. Uh, in fact, it wasn't really about material reality. It was about the sort of vibe that one gives off as a politician. Well, if one thinks about vibe as a kind of sentimental ca category, then that's not so good, really, on the whole. We would tend to think that favors what Weber would have thought of as sort of charismatic forms of leadership or rational forms of leadership. Now, rational forms of leadership have also led us into all sorts of disasters. And there's been a long-standing critique in international law of expertise, um, just as there is now a sort of long-standing critique of populism. So it's very, very hard to navigate these waters. Um, and I guess the book is partly a navigation. It's not so much saying we must all become tearful sentimentalists, um, nor that we all retreat into expertise, but, but that we somehow realize the stakes of being one or the other, that we come to these problems somehow more self-consciously. Um, but it's certainly not a sort of prescription. This isn't the authoritarian and sentimental life of international law. But yeah, good question, good question. Thank you. The next question that we have is from another teaching assistant, Sayre Nazavi Sayen. She asks that according to you, uh, or relying on your talk, she is asking that, how can law professors contribute to the making or reform of international law? Well, that's a good question. One answer, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, there's a very technical answer to that question, isn't there? So when we start out as international law types, we are often directed by our teachers towards Article 38 of the ICJ statute. That's the first thing we all look at. And we notice there that the writings of publicists are a source, you know, not just an interpretation, but a source of international law. So already we've got a, a, a discipline that seems peculiarly hospitable to the writings of scholars and intellectuals and the thinking of intellectuals. So just in, a, in an official, you know, sl slightly um, work a day, maybe even boring um, um, way, we're right there at the center of things. Now, Article 38 really means, you know, Brocious, Suarez, Oppenheim, it doesn't mean people can writing now, but it, but, you know, conceivably it, it can do. And the ICJ hasn't been entirely adverse to to using contemporary publicists to buttress their um, legal arguments, opinions, judgments. That's one aspect of it. The second is that in this highly irregular, decentralized field of law, I think it's probably the case that scholars have comparatively more influence than they might have in areas of law that are, that are sort of um, better stocked or resourced institutionally, normatively, so international, so legal orders with, you know, courts, judges, so on and so forth, um, probably have a, pro probably don't, are not the sorts of legal orders in which scholars can perhaps have quite the same influence. I don't know, I haven't done the studies on this, but international law is what international lawyers do, as someone once said, and it's, as, as I sort of modify the slogan in my book, international law is what international lawyers are. You know, it's how we live our lives, what we do, how we practice, the sorts of ideas we have, how we travel or don't travel, all sorts of things go into to the, the stuff of being an international lawyer, a public and public private figure, if you like, of international law. And because I think the international lawyer is so much at the center of the field in the absence of all the other accoutrements of a legal order, police, courts, and so on. That means that a study of the international lawyer in action seems so worthwhile. So, I mean, this could have been, I mean, easily titled the sentimental life of international, sentimental lives of international lawyers. Um, I'm not in fact entirely sure why it wasn't. So. In that sense, we, we are important to the construction and reconstruction of the discipline. But also to go back to something I said before about the, about the various British prime, prime ministers we've had, you know, if they're speaking the language of international law in, in relation to Ukraine, and Ukraine is one of the biggest 
issues we have at the moment, you know, threatening planetary survival at its extremes, then international lawyers have a really important role in thinking seriously about the consequences of that language, the way it's structured, the way it's received by the political elites. And I think that's a very, very powerful role and we underestimate it at our peril. I think there's been a longstanding tendency and it's something that's been critiqued by many people before me, but a longstanding tendency for international lawyers to think of their field as somehow weak Slightly it's sort of irresponsible, idealistic, waiting to be heard, never quite listened to, that kind of thing. But I think we really have to grow up and accept that we have been listened to. People are now speaking this language and we now have to bear responsibility for the consequences of that. Thank you. The next question is on uh, using imagination in international law or in international law cases, or maybe even, uh, whatever we do with international law. In your book, you have mentioned that somebody once told you that the American Society of International Law's prize for creative contribution to international law is given to those who make up international law. And you have also, I think, referred to uh, Watson's address in American Society of International Law's annual meeting that sometimes uh, we do not focus enough on the law as it is and we sort of create some fictionary international law. On the other hand, uh, there is Andrea Bianchi who is saying that we should be warned against a fatal attraction of unimaginative thinking. So I was wondering if you would share your insights on this line between being imaginative and being true to the existing law. Thank you. Yeah, Sayeri, thank you for that uh, little note. I'm glad I answered the question. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's right. So um, when I won that prize, um, someone who's now a judge at the ICJ actually said to me, that's the prize they give for people who make it up. And it made me, made me wonder what it meant to make something up. Um, so on one hand, Perhaps we're excluded, positively excluded from making things up. Um, to be a lawyer is to cease making things up, to sort of put away childish things, if you like. You, you now, you're responsible for administering a legal order that somebody else made up, surely, or that, that has a set of pre-existing rules um, that you simply interpret, try to understand or, or teach your students. So on one hand, there isn't much making up to be done. Uh, on the other hand, we know that law is a perpetual reform project too. There are, of course, explicit reform projects, the introduction of legislation, legal change, um, but implicitly at all times, the system is sort of being made up. Um, rules are being adapted to contemporary circumstances. Judges are speaking in certain ways to contemporary moments in ways that they couldn't have anticipated and in ways, of course, the law can't have anticipated. So there is a sense of, making it up. This all goes back, of course, to sort of familiar Dworkian dialectic, Dworkinian dialectics around um, declaring law and making law. But I think at a sort of at a, at another level, I don't want to say deeper because Dworkin is pretty deep on these things, but at, on a, at another level, as international lawyers, again, I think we're much more involved explicitly in the making up of the field. I mean, for example, there are precious few precedents available to us. There isn't much of what one might call a jurisprudence. So um, both in a kind of um, trivial sense, we're always making things up. But I think in a less or non-trivial sense, we're involved quite frequently in acts of imagination. Um, I was trained by J.B. White in Ann Arbor, who wrote a book, in fact, called The Legal Imagination, about the, the importance of imagination as an international legal tool. Now, obviously, imaginative solutions to uh, marital disputes, for example, whatever it is, or some mergers or acquisitions, whatever it happens to be, are often commended as breakthroughs in legal thinking. Um, but I think what, what a a Andrea means um, is something slightly different, that international law is also a place for 
imaginative or utopian speculation. It's uh, sort of unusual in that regard. To think about international laws, to think about world order, to think about world order is to think imaginatively about that order. And he's been at the absolute vanguard of trying to apply these techniques of, of, of imagination. I wrote a chapter for a recent book called, I think it was called 50 Concepts of International Law, something like that. Um, and my concept, I was actually offered sovereignty as my concept, <laughs> but I, um, I chose imagination instead, and they seem to find that uh, tolerable at least. And so I, I wrote about imagination, and I wrote not just about the promise of imagination, but also of the, again, the possible pitfalls of approaching anything, international or whatever it is, um, through these imaginative, what I call imaginative excesses. You know, one could call forms of totalitarianism acts of imagination, for example. Um, it's the imagination of the half-crazed dictator in some cases that's the mark of contemporary politics. So imagination at times needs to be constrained too, if it's the wrong sort of imagination. And I guess a lot of this will depend on the sorts of political projects one wants to one wants to pursue. Again, there's not a, imagination doesn't have its own politics, just as utopia doesn't have its own politics. It's, it's not that some people are utopians and other people aren't. It's that some people have some forms of politics and others have other forms of politics. Utopianism tells you nothing about the person, really. A person could, you know, wish for a world of clones or a sort of Maoist cultural revolution in perpetuity or some Moorish, Thomas More style utopia. And there are, there, are, there are as many utopias as there are political projects. Thank you for that answer. Uh, only recently, I think the day before yesterday, in a sensational uh, political case in West Bengal, India, uh, the lawyer for the state, he was alluding to Macbeth. Uh, when he was opposing the bail petition, he was alluding to Macbeth. So I was wondering, as part of your book is also about the use of literary works and linguistic tools, I was wondering that could you share something parallel in international law that in international courts directly uh, fictional work or literary work is being used by the councils or by the judges? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. So uh, I, I, mean, I don't, don't have anything immediately to hand, uh, but interestingly enough, just recently I was writing a obituary for, I was co-writing with Marty Koskinyemi actually, an obituary for Judge James Crawford at the ICJ, and I looked at some of James's uh, various opinions um, as a judge and also his submissions before the court, and they were infused with uh, literary quality, uh, not just because of the way he phrased some of his submissions, but also because he adverted to various um, literary works. In international humanitarian law, there's been a long-standing um, pr practice of using Shakespeare, and Thomas uh, Ted, sorry, uh, Ted Moran in International Humanitarian Law wrote a book called Henry's Wars um, or Shakespeare's Laws, Henry's Wars, something like that. John Sutherland, the literary theorist, has written also about Shakespeare and, and international law. I wanted, wanted, frankly, to avoid Shakespeare um, because Shakespeare is the most familiar figure in law and literature studies, uh, along with Dickens via someone like Richard Posner. But I think there's been a very productive use of literature in international legal theory recently too, through people like um, Christopher Givers and Joey Slaughter and Basuki Messiah in her work on, on the Amstad uh, um, rebellion in the London Review of International Law. So there's been work in scholarship and in court, um, but I haven't done a study of ICJ usage of literary works. So that, that would be quite interesting, actually. I hope somebody does go out and do, do that. Thank you. Now, would it be a fair way of looking at your book as a sort of manifesto of sentimental international law or sentimental life of international law or a different kind of way of looking at international law? <laughs> 
Well, the short answer to that is yes, but but the slightly longer answer is that you use the word manifesto, and that's actually the second time that's been used in these conversations. My friend and colleague, Madeleine Chiam, who's just written a book called International Law in Public Debate, um, talking of uh, international legal usages beyond the academy. So, you know, I said international law is what international lawyers are. Her response is international law is what non-international lawyers do or say. So Madeline described my book as a manifesto. Um, and there has been some work on manifestos done recently by um, scholars in, in the United Kingdom. Um, Theresa O'Donnell's written written some some of some some work on that. Um, Aoife, um, yeah, so so a number of people have spoken about this sort of thing. Um, yeah, so I think it's um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a manif manifesto is a good word. Uh, I think my book is a bit of a manifesto. I think it's pretending not to be, but uh, there's an element in which it is. It's a sort of way of saying this is what you should do. You know, we're very reluctant to uh, produce work like that, but um, but that's uh, that's that's certainly that's certainly part of it. I, I wanted to own the idea of the of the manifesto. Aoife O'Donoghue, Ruth Ruth Houghton have uh, written on this subject recently as well. Um, um, so I recommend their, their work on manifestos, but yeah, I, I'd like to pursue the idea of the manifesto, the sort of frank call to arms. There's not enough of that in international law. Thank you so much. We're almost out of time. So this would be our last question, uh, relying on Europites as you have uh, used in uh, his work in your book. Who's, who's work? Sorry. Europites. Uh, it's a quote from, I think, uh, uh, work of the Latin writer, I guess. Right, right. So it, it says that it is not the words ringing delight in the ear that one should speak, but yeah. those that have the power to save their hearer's honorable name. So I was wondering how much semantics really matter. Well, there is a there is a, a view that, that that they're all that does matter. That nothing nothing else really matters. Um, some people might find that an excessive position, but really, almost everything we do in contemporary life and politics is has at least a rhetorical aspect to it, either explicitly, you know, parliamentary rhetoric, or in a more underlying sort of post-structuralist sense that we are composed of the of the linguistic categories that that, that, that that precede us or that we bring into existence. So I think that that that, that, that this rhetorical approach is absolutely absolutely vital. And it may be, I know Zabida has asked a question about international law shift from positive law to natural law. Maybe it's a shift from positive law to a more so linguistic mentality, one that's less tied to text and therefore maybe maybe more susceptible to some natural law uh, or naturalistic ideas of, of law. I don't know, a lot could be said about that. And this is not the time to sort of explore that, that relationship. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's right. That's, I, I would say that um, it's like the, this, this, this French philosopher I always quote once said, uh, um, hold on to your prejudices, they're all you've got. Now, I wouldn't recommend anyone hold on to their prejudices exactly, but hold on to your rhetoric, hold on to your language. As an international lawyer, it's all you've got. Thank you so much, Professor Simpson. I would say maybe as law students of this, lawyers is the worst that we all have. That's the only tool that we have. So thank you so much for once again for your excellent talk. And Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I mean, it's great, great to see so many people in the... Uh, in the room. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to ask all your questions or indeed see you all arrayed there, but I'm, I'm very grateful that you've all turned up in such numbers to hear this. Thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for their questions and participation. Have a good day. See you.